Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best Hello, in everyone. everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. I am the CEO of Rue Global Impact, and I'm really excited about my guest today. And you know, I always am so excited about my guests because I, I have people on that I love to talk to, but my guests today are mentors, friends, and colleagues. I have two of my senior staff members on the show today. I have Rosemary Musaccio, who is our Chief Accessibility Officer, and one of the few Chief Accessibility Officers in the world, and I would um, bet anybody, one of the smartest women, if not the smartest woman in accessibility. So she's on the show today, and I'm so stoked to have her on the show. And then I also have Lamandre Pugh, who is our Chief Sustainability Officer, and he is a host of his own podcast called The Five Ps, and his voice is amazing. And he came, coined a term that Dr. Caroline Casey is now using all over the world too, the illusion of inclusion. So inclusion illusion. And I'm gonna, he's going to tell you a little bit about that. And Rosemary and Lamandre have both been on the show before. And I'll remind you that Rosemary uses augmented communications. And so she was kind enough to um, provide me with questions. And then she's going to let her communications device speak for her. But what we're talking about today is caregiving. And just to remind you, there are caregiver, caregivers, um, there's a major shortage all over the world uh, for good caregivers. And we unfortunately do not pay caregivers very much money considering the really important work that they do. The average caregiver in the United States may, makes $22,000 or less a year probably less usually. I know that my daughter, Sarah, with Down syndrome, she is living in a supported apartment and she has caregivers and, and you know, sometimes the caregivers, they just don't come and they, there's major turnover. And I just thought it would be very interesting to listen to Lamandre and Rosemary talk about that. And also Lamandre is going to tell us a little bit about what him and Rosemary are planning in the background to really turn up the voices because one thing that I'm seeing and I've talked about on air and I'm talking about on stage is that we don't have enough representation of people with disabilities having these conversations. I mean, once again, invisible disabilities is the most, you know, there are more people with invisible disabilities than physical visible disabilities. So it's very important, and I say this to you and all the time, that we have good representation on stage, people with different disabilities, people of different d d diversity and, and intersectionality and all that stuff. And um, that's one reason why I'm so proud to have Rosemary and Lamandre as part of the team because they are rock stars and they teach me every day. And, and we don't realize what they have to go through every day. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So Lamandre, before we start talking about caregiving, would you mind just telling the audience a little bit about some of the stuff that you and Rosemary are planning because it is going to be so, so delicious. So um, maybe we could start there. Absolutely. And thank you, first of all, for having uh, having us again on the show to, to, to talk about such an important topic. We've really got some exciting things uh, in store. Rosemary is an incredible voice. And what I mean by that, her content is really engaging and it's important content to get out there. And so we've been thinking of ways that we can get that content out there. We've been thinking of ways that we can get, get her voice to be heard out there. So we're looking at pushing a new podcast that, that, that we've been working on to really talk, talk about the issues that are important to us to talk about everyday life, to talk about how we can change things systemically as well as individually to help people move forward. Because we honestly believe that, you know, a, a lot of it is not just that we want these things done, but people don't know what they are. People have no idea the impact by and large. So we want to help present that. And we want to do this in a way that is palpable. We want to do it in a way that is not a drudgery, but you can really get a sense of the personalities that's behind it. You can get a sense of the lives that are being impacted. So the other thing that we're looking at, and this is not just me and Rosemary, but we're also looking at highlighting some other personalities with the series called Moment of Impact. So we've really got some exciting things in store 
for the beginning of the year with Root Global Impact. And we're just thankful that we're a part of this and we can actually help move the needle forward for all of humanity. So thank you for the opportunity to share that information. Dr. Yeah, I'm so excited. That's going to be amazing. And I know that Lamondre, we also talked about this off air and I just, and I, I wanted to encourage you and Rosemary both to talk about this more, but there are so many issues um, when you're a person with physical disabilities and like transportation issues and housing and, you know, caregiver issues. And I know that you spoke um, for one of um, our, our, you know, new clients, which we are thrilled with, Lily. And um, you spoke in Indianapolis on December 2nd for them where they were celebrating right. the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, which we appreciate. And Darren, Darren Rowan works with them and he himself um, is blind and amazing, amazing, an amazing man. He really um, he's is. He's going to be on the show in the future. But I was just, just to give everybody a little peek, sneak, a sneak peek, I should say, of, you know, transportation issues. And this is going to be an episode in the future on, you know, LaMondre and Rosemary. We'll make sure we get it out. But just tell the, the audience a little bit about what happened with transportation uh, when you were in Indianapolis yesterday. Absolutely. Or First of all, the trip, was, the trip was amazing. And Lily is an amazing organization. We have to talk about the history of Lilly as a company and the importance that it has had for civil rights throughout its existence. Absolutely amazing. From day one, the story was just incredible. But I will tell you, while I was there in Indianapolis, when I arrived there, I rode uh, the bus. I rode Greyhound because I don't have to get out of my chair uh, when when traveling, which is a which is a, a really major piece of the puzzle. Got there. And we had to wait two hours and 45 minutes for a prearranged taxi for a prearranged uh, situation that should have taken no more than 30 minutes uh, to cure. Now, keep in mind, the hotel that I was staying at was only about six minutes down the road, but it was too cold to walk, and I had all of my luggage with me. Uh, and so I called over and over again. Long story short, two, and a half, two hours and 45 minutes uh, after we arrived there, the taxi showed up. It takes me the six minutes down the street. I pull out my card to pay, and this is what I hear. Are you going to add a tip? That's what was said. <laughs> and then the only thing that came to mind was, first of all, and I said this to him, I said, you were two hours and 45 minutes late. And he said, well, that's not my fault. I'm a private contractor. And the only thing that I could do at that point was hand in my card and walk away. And the reason that I had to do that was quite simple things would have come out of my mouth that my mother and my grandmother would not have been proud of. So, uh, so we had that. But then the second piece to that, though, was the very next day was the day that I had to speak uh, for the organization. And that was the big day. That was the important day. So in order for me to get there, I ended up, I ended up paying an additional $100 to go five minutes down the street. But that was the only way that I could guarantee that I would be there on time. So transportation is a serious issue, but I will have to tell you, some places are getting it right. When I was in New York, we spoke for another organization while, when I was in New York, and the same problem came up. Had a prearranged situation, the taxi did not come. I'd already spent $70 for them to be there, I'd already paid it. And someone just suggested, hey, why don't you look at one of the hail ride hailing organizations like Uber? And so I was like, you know what, I'll give it a shot opened up the application, looked on my phone, and I saw Uber WAVE, W-A-V. WAVE stands for Wheelchair Accessible Vehicle. When I tapped that, four minutes later, a wheelchair accessible Uber pulled up on the corner. I used Uber the whole time I was in New York City because of that. And I asked the driver, I said, how is it that this works here and it doesn't work anywhere else in the country that I, that I've been to. And I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't work in other cities, but that I visited. And he said, New York made it a priority yes. that in order for Uber or Lyft or any of the hailing services to operate within the city limits, they had to provide comparable services to people with disabilities. And here's the thing. He was like, it may be instead of four minutes, it may be 10 minutes. Then he said, the only difference is after 11, you may have to wait 15 minutes. I was like, 15 minutes? 
So I want you to know that there are solutions to these problems. Don't believe the hype when people say, well, there's not much we can do about it. We have to build the business case. The business is there. I'm not going to stand and wait at a bus stop if I know that the bus that comes is not going to be accessible. But if you let me know that you have a service that I can use, I guarantee you, you'll get the business. So transportation is a huge issue, but I wanted to show both sides of it. I agree. And I, um, in the future, am thrilled that Victor um, Carlisi from the mayor's office in New York City, which is one of the people that's responsible for that, and he himself is a wheelchair user. Um, New York is doing amazing things with disability inclusion. Like you said, this is something that's available in different parts of the world, including different parts of the United States. So don't tell us it can't be done. We know it can be done because... You know, New York's doing it. So I'm looking forward to interviewing uh, Victor, and you might want to interview him on your show too, because I know you don't just look at very deliberately. We don't just look at with the five P's, just disability inclusion right. issues. You want to look at, you know, let's not just say, oh, because he's disabled, he has to only talk about disability issues. Right. So you're talking about issues that are impacting our world. It's a very, very well, well done show. Very interesting. Thank you. And Thank you. Rosemary had her own show. Show. And but then we had some technical problems that we still have not solved, but we're going to solve them. We're working on um, that. And yeah, we're working on it. So we're going to bring uh, Rosemary to the table. But let's let's go ahead and I know we already did this, but let's take a minute to. I just want to introduce you a little bit more. And um, so I'm going to start with Rosemary's ladies first. I'll start with and Rosemary has worked with me. I have been blessed to work with Rosemary since the early 2000s. She was um, a technology manager um, for my former company, Tech Access, and she's brilliant. She's brilliant. Uh, She's she's very spicy. She's very, she's got a great sense of humor. She is a poet. She has written a a book of poetry that has over 400, no, 100 poems in this particular book. It's being illustrated right now. So she's really a talented woman and she are, she's originally from Italy so she's a fluent she speaks Italian she speaks English um, she's just an amazing person she won a huge award at IAAP as being uh, because she is so good to the community and sharing her information and she also speaks at conferences um, and what she does is and you'll hear her use her augmented augmentative communications now because I'm going to ask her questions she's going to answer but what she does is she prepares all the all of the information in advance and then lets her um, augmented communication device speak for her so she's an amazing talented woman and um, and she's she's changing the world so I'm really really excited to have Rosemary here and then Lamondre also worked with us at Tech Access for um, for a few years, and then he left us and went off on his own doing his own business. And then, luckily, he came back to us at Rue Global Impact. And Lamondre has always had such a wise voice, such a powerful, light-filled voice. And we, as we were trying to decide what Lamondre, you know, I knew I wanted Lamondre to be part of the team, but we didn't want it to be predictable. And so that's why Lamondre really cares about the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals that the United Nations has created. So he has had multiple shows, uh, multiple radio shows. He is a very sought after um, speaker and um, has spoken multiple times, I know, for Real Global, which we're very excited about. And he just has a voice that is changing the world. And so I'm just so blessed to work with these two individuals. And, um, and, and you know, why don't, why don't we, I start with you, Rosemary, and I'm going to ask you the first question, and I'm going to go back and forth, and then Rosemary will also, um, she'll, she'll give a, she, she might make comments in the chat window that one of us will read to the audience, but we're trying to be very deliberate about how we do this because Rosemary had to prepare. She had to prepare, so she gave me her questions, and then she had to put all of her, she had to answer the questions and load it into her device so the device can speak for her. So um, she doesn't have quite the flexibility that Lamondre and I do since we're speaking in a more traditional manner. Um, but it just shows you how brilliant this woman is. She's just so brilliant. I, I just, um, she's been such a mentor 
factor to me. So, so Rosemary, we're going to start with you and we're going to talk about caregiving services. And so what care, caregiving services have you needed? <laughs> she, her mother's talking in the background with her Italian accent. So that Rosemary's getting her computer uh, program for those that might be listening. So she is working her technology. And I'm honored to be here once again on human potential at work and with my colleague and friend Lamanda. Since my cerebral palsy limits use of my hands, I need help with daily activities such as bathing slash showering, dressing, feeding, going to the bathroom, grooming, and getting set up at the computer. Until seven years ago, my then 80-year-old mother provided for my personal care needs for most of my life except when friends accompanied me on trips. Besides caring for me, she did all of the household chores. Mom thought she could do this forever until health issues appeared and she was forced to realize we needed assistance. Adjusting to someone else providing physical care for me was difficult for her. Her strong Italian character didn't make the adjustment easier. She dedicated 46 years of her life to caring for me. At first, she felt like she was being replaced. Now she panics if a caregiver doesn't show up. Very powerful, very powerful. Rosemary once told me that when she lies down flat, she only has control of blinking her eyes. And but we don't want you to feel sorry for Rosemary because she brings so much to the table. She's such a smart woman. She is a college graduate. She's traveled all over the world. So she doesn't want you to feel sorry for her because she's got a lot to offer the world. But it would be nice if caregivers showed up. And if it wasn't so hard to get caregivers and, you know, all these other things. So, um, Lamontre, let's move to you. When did you start using attendant and how are you using attendant care services? Sure. I started using attendant care services when I was 18 years old. Uh, and, you know, I, like Rosemary, my mother uh, primarily did all of my services. I had spinal muscular atrophy. And basically, I have the same functional uh, limitations as a person. Uh, with quadriplegia. So pretty much all of my muscles from my neck down, I really have a hard time using. In fact, uh, someone has to feed me, someone has to bathe me, someone has to put me in my chair. But I, I started using it when I was 18 years old and it was really an adjustment. It was an adjustment for myself. It was an adjustment for my mother uh, as well. And um, the things that I use them for, the same things that Rosemary just mentioned, uh, you know, getting out of bed, bathing, feeding, uh, all of those things are, are things that I have to have um, help with as well. Um, and what I would tell you is that it is a, um, it is definitely a, uh, it is definitely the thing that really helps me to, to be independent. It's the thing that allows me to live, live my life the way that I do. You know, it, it's really an amazing thing. Yeah, and I know that my daughter, Sarah, once again, she's using caregiver services, and she's using them to help her with her meds, to help. She she wants to cook by herself, but they've come into the apartment three times, and there was smoke. <laughs> we don't want smoke at the apartment. So we actually need to um, teach Sarah, you know, to cook without, you, you know, she, she needs more support um, cooking. Um, and to do it independently, you know, we're going to have to be more deliberate. So, but I know that she has often a hard time because the caregivers, um, they, they quit, they, they don't show up, they show up late. I know that Rosemary was afraid she wasn't going to be able to do the program today because she was afraid her caregiver would come in late. 
because this has happened multiple times. And Rosemary even confided in this that the agency she's been working with gave her a 30 day notice. Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, we don't want to work with you. You're too much trouble or you're too. So it's, these are huge issues. And keep in mind, don't assume that all of these expenses are paid because they're not. People with disabilities who, once again, are underemployed or unemployed, even though they're more than capable of doing jobs, often are, most of their money is going out to pay for caregivers, even to get them to the point where they can go to work. Right. Um, it, it, that's a huge issue. I don't know if you've experienced that, Lamondra. You just talked about the extra $100 that you had to pay just to go five miles. You also had mentioned, which I thought, just giving another shout out to Lily, Lily's response to what happened and what they were going to do. I thought maybe you could just do that and then I'll go back to the next question with uh, Rosemary. Absolutely. Lily, Lily's response, and th this is so important. It's important to have advocates outside of, of, of the affected community um, simply because I was there to bring value to Lily. And because of the lack of adequate transportation, that value could have been missed Lily could have missed that. So Lily's perspective was, we've got to do something about this. We've got to do something. And so they literally went on a letter writing campaign that I'm sure will uh, come to fruition because this just happened earlier this week. So it, it's been a, um, it really is important that, that we find our allies, we find our champions, and we find those who can speak with us, not for us, but with us, in this journey, and I believe Lily is the perfect uh, ally in in that regard. And Deborah, you mentioned something about about the the the, the troubles and the struggles that you have in, in terms of finding good people to do this. There are so many good people that are involved in attending care services. I, I've have been extremely fortunate in that I've I've got two really great attendants right now that work with me. But I will tell you, I had to go through a process to find them, number one. And this is what I also realized. It's a sad thing when the people who care for you, when the people who help you live the life that you want to live, struggle to live theirs because they are not reimbursed enough, because they're not paid enough. And I believe that that is a, an issue that we really have to confront and address head on. It makes no sense to me that someone who helps me to live the life that I live has a trouble making a living doing it. Know, um, it's, so it's we've so got to work on terrible. that. What we pay these caregivers and their jobs are so important. They're so important. It's and it's only going to get worse. You know, they say yeah. that the one job jobs that they we do not predict that are going to go away are caregiver jobs. And right. the problem is if you flood the market with even more caregivers, even though we need qualified caregivers, but you're still not going to pay them. I mean, they're pay, they're being paid well below the poverty line. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not fair to treat human beings that way. It's can I share this fair. with you? Can I, can I share this with you and your audience really quickly? Here's the thing though. There is a solution for that, particularly here in the U S and, and, and let me, let, let me preference this by, by, by saying, People are going to get the care. It just so happens right now that the priority goes to institutionalization. The priority goes to nursing homes. The priorities go to uh, environments that are restrictive in terms, in terms of a person's ability to live free in the community. Do you realize that the average cost of a yearly nursing home stay is about $92,000 a year? And that's for a private room. For a semi-private room, it's about $82,000 a year. And the insurance companies and Medicaid and those kinds of things, they'll pay for that. However, it would literally cost at least a good, uh, what, uh, maybe a little bit more than half of that to provide those comparable services in the individual's home. And the way you do that is through attending care services. So really, the money is there. It's just how we prioritize it. It is just how we look at it. And the truth is, People live longer, they live happier, they live more fulfilled lives when they're in their own environment versus being in an institution. So right. it can be done. We right. just have to make certain. And, and that's if we raise the pay of the people who actually provided the services, it would still be cheaper than being in a nursing home or an institution like that. I agree. And Rosemary had made a comment that um, she's had caregivers that have borrowed money from her. Because, you know, the reality is they don't have, they're being paid so horribly, they don't yeah. even have the money for little things. And I know that 
we understand it at Real Global Impact. So for example, you know, whenever Lily asked to have somebody speak and I recommended you, LaMondre, I did tell them that part of getting access to this amazing speaker is that you're going to be providing a caregiver. And so the, it's going to be a little bit more expensive with, the, with your expenses, but well worth it. And I'm sure Lily would agree with me on that. So, so. it's just, th there's, you know, we had a lot of problems when it comes to caregiving and we do need to really address that. And I thought, not only did I want to start the conversation here on the human potential at work, but I know that Lamondra, you and Rosemary are going to take this conversation and take it in even bigger ways and also are available to speak at conferences about this as well. You want two dynamite speakers, you put Rosemary and Lamondre on the stage and you're going to wow everybody. So, and I'll go with them too. So, it's just really exciting because this is how you change the world, making sure that people know what's there. But let me ask Rosemary. Rosemary, what would you describe as the ideal caregiver? Rosemary is using assistive technology to um, take care of her computer. It's very interesting watching Rosemary work because she uses technology to really make a difference in the world. The ideal caregiver must have three qualifications. Stop first, they have to care more about a client than a paycheck. For instance, if you go to the breakfast table with matching clothes and hair combed nicely, then your health aide puts her heart into it. If she has you looking like a clown, however, she's just there for the money. When the caregiver truly shows interest in client's well-being, she does things beyond what she is required to do. She may notice a dirty wheelchair cushion and wash it, or she may organize a client's dresser items. Some of my caregivers have bought me items I needed out of their money. Two of my caregivers have gone on trips where they went beyond the call of duty, walking miles pushing my wheelchair. The second quality of a good caregiver is skill. One training class and a certificate doesn't make someone skilled. Unfortunately, some agencies hire aides with just those factors, no other qualifications except helping a grandparent, perhaps. Just like other health professionals, Home health aides should be interns where they could get hands-on experience by shadowing seasoned colleagues. Seeing how something is done instead of hearing or reading it makes a difference. The third criterion for good caregiving is openness. When I began having home health aides, I was hesitant to ask them to do something or tell them something wasn't done right. I feared they would be mad or not return. Consequently, I ended up being in discomfort or dissatisfied. So I forced myself to express my needs and do it respectfully, always saying please and thank you. Aids also must be open in saying if they can do something, such as shaving you. Then you can ask another caregiver to do it. Well said, Rosemary. Well said. Yeah. Come on, Drake. Let me ask you, outside of the obvious, what do you really, really get it um, from having attendant care giver services, besides yeah. some of the things you've already mentioned? Yeah, outside of ADLs, outside of the activities of daily living. <laughs> and this goes really to more of a philosophical um, view of this. For me, when that person comes into my home uh, in the mornings, to get me out of bed, to help me bathe, to brush my teeth. They're just not doing those tasks. What they're doing is they're allowing me or helping me to really be a part of the human experience. They're really allowing me to say, yeah, I can go out in my community dressed the way that I want to be dressed and do the things that I want to do because without them, I, I, I could not do that. For example, I love ties. I'm a tie fanatic. I love bow ties. I love straight ties. I love tying in different ways. And every attendant that I've had that really has been a good attendant that exhibited those three ideal qualities that Rosemary just so eloquently spoke about, each of them learned to tie the ties the way that I like them. 
Each of them learned how to tie bow ties. They learned how to tie full Windsor knots. They learned how to tie half Windsor knots. And do you know why they did that? Because that's what I wanted. That's what I needed. So outside of the bathing and feeding and all of that kind of stuff, what my attendant care services actually allows me to do is it allows me to be me. When I close out my show, I always close it with live big, live full, and live authentic. Those attendants allow, this service allows me to do that, to live big, to live full, and to be authentically LaMondre Pugh. And that's what they do for so many other people. And so that's, that, that's what they do for me beyond just the activities of daily living. Yeah, I, I find that there's one caregiver that my daughter has worked with for a couple of years, and they have such a deep relationship. It's a beautiful relationship. And I, I, I watch them together and, and this woman just gets my daughter. Right. And because sometimes Sarah gets sick of being the, you know, people see that she has Down syndrome and they just assume, oh, she's one of, she's so happy and she's so joyous all the time. And you know, my daughter is, you know, she's an individual. Sometimes she's joyous and happy and sometimes she's very moody mm -hmm. and right. sometimes she doesn't feel good. And she's, she doesn't want to be the poster child for people with Down syndrome. She right. wants to be an individual. She actually said to me, mom, I'm normal. It's like normal. Who wants to be normal? All right. But, uh, <laughs> normal. She said that to her purple-haired mother. I know. I know. It's like, no, no, no. Let's not go for the inward. But anyway, okay. So, um, Rosemary, how can being cared for by another person be difficult? When I started having caregivers, I got embarrassed. No one else has ever washed my body and taken me to the bathroom besides mom and friends. I still feel humiliated when a new caregiver does these things. Can you do your business while another person looks at you while she asks, are you finished every minute? No, my body isn't on a timer. Thankfully, some caregivers understand this. They occupy themselves on their phones while I complete nature's calls. It's difficult also when caregivers are unskilled. An example of an unskilled caregiver is one who doesn't know how to give a sponge bath or other basic hygiene tasks. One time a maid sat me on the toilet without pulling down my pants. Guess they were invisible to her. Aids also haven't washed my face or my private parts. How presumptuous of me to think they've no basic personal needs of human beings. I have written personal care instructions to explain exactly how I need my daily care mask. While the instructions have helped many aides, some don't follow them. So I have to reiterate by typing to them when they put me at my computer, that is, if they know how to set me up. Yeah, good. Well, sort of chilling, sort of chilling examples, but uh, very powerful examples. And, you know, that's something that um, maybe you yourself has not have not experienced somebody having to take care of you. But, you know, it's, you know, we're these fragile human beings. And so, you know, if, it, if you haven't experienced it, you probably are going to be in your life, your lifetime. So wonderful examples, Rosemary. Rosemary, let me also ask you, what are some of the nicest things a caregiver ever did for you? A bigger problem is when caregivers don't show up. If my mother wasn't around, I would be stuck in bed hungry and defecating on myself until someone came. Even with my mother, the situation becomes frustrating if no aid comes. Since she can't lift me, we have to call a neighbor, a godsend, to help. Although homemade agencies are supposed to provide backups, sometimes none are available. In fact, I've had a lot of problems with not having backups in the last couple of weeks, which has put me behind work and made mom exhausted. So I'm looking for another agency. I think the best way to find one is by recommendations by people who use. 
Yeah, and um, Rosemary lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> so if you, right, Rosemary to Cincinnati. And if, if you're in that area, you, you, you definitely want Rosemary as your customer. She's a brilliant global speaker. She is the top in her game in Cleveland. Cleveland. Yes. Sorry, C, the C thing. Uh, sorry, I put you in a different place. So Cleveland, Ohio, she doesn't want to move to Cincinnati yet. She likes living in Cleveland. So, um, Lamandre, what are some of the major challenges you see regarding attendant care services that we haven't talked about? Well, from a systemic, um, from a systemic standpoint, and I have to reiterate this, we've mentioned it, but we have to increase the payment that people receive because what happens is a lot of good people uh, end up leaving simply because they can't support themselves and their family. So we have to, um, we have to provide uh, better payment for folks. Um, I think also the other thing is many of the issues that Rosemary talked about from a, as an individual, um, that we can't look at this as if it's someone is doing you a favor because it's a job, number one, but it is a job where most of the, the, the most intimate of intimate things are being done. Um, so helping people to understand that this is not a medical situation, but this is a life situation. This is a social situation. Um, those things have, 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 once we elevate the thinking to that level, we can then address some of the issues that Rosemary just talked about, like some of the, the, the grooming issues and those kinds of things. I often make jokes and I'll say things like, uh, when, when, when I'm with my attendant, I'll say things like, okay, make it look like somebody loves me. You know, I'll say things like that. And even though it's joking, I really mean that. I need to look like at least Lamandre loves Lamandre. So if Lamandre loves Lamandre, he's going to present himself as if he's cared for. And that's really what I'm saying to them. Help me go out here like somebody cares for me. So that means wash my face. I don't have any hair. I was going to say cut my, comb my hair. I don't have any hair. So uh, make sure my bald head is shiny. You know, those kinds of things. Um, and it, it, it really... Really, what that what, what that is saying is, let's humanize this whole process. Yes. yes. Let's take the, the the I'm doing something special for that special group over there. No, you're doing something for Rosemary, and she's amazing. You're doing something for Sarah, and she's amazing. You're doing something for Lamandre, and he I, you know. So <laughs> it's it's just those kinds of things that that I believe are are, are barriers. That we have to overcome and that's to humanize this thing and to and to and to increase the pay uh, that that people are getting and i believe once we once we start doing those two things i think that we can really make a difference and just let me say this also i you know in rosemary's response to the question about the the, the issues she gave some very um shocking things but if you notice something and i want you to see the light in this did you hear her sarcasm did you hear the snarkiness of some of those comments. And let me tell you why that is, because that means that she's a fighter. That means that she's resilient. Yes, these situations are situations that affect our lives every day, and it affects the quality of our lives every day. But that's someone who's fighting for it. That's someone who's not only fighting for it, damn it, she's going to get, excuse me, I'm sorry. No, she's going to get it. No good word, right. And, she's you know, get it. And, and people, you know, I think often these caregivers don't even know who they're dealing with because yeah. Rosemary has been involved in some of the biggest cases of accessibility in the United States. Rosemary it teaches other people to do digital accessibility. She has been a writer. She was the top of her class. The woman is brilliant. Her voice, her mind is needed in these conversations. And she does such an amazing job. She has her own company. Once again, we're really blessed that she's the chief accessibility officer for Real Global Impact, but she also has a company and she has other clients. So she's an entrepreneur. She's an amazing woman. And and sometimes I know people can't see past your disability. And I think that's such a shame because I have never seen Rosemary's disability. All right. I see is a woman that's smarter than me, brighter than me, prettier than me. I, I, she, she's an amazing woman. And I've always only seen that with Rosemary. Well, this and, is the thing that I, this is the thing that I would also say in, in that. And, th and this is, this is something that, that stands out. I love the fact 
that she is an entrepreneur, that she is a writer, and that she's doing all these wonderful things because here's the deal. Top of her class means that, no, she just wasn't the smart disabled chick. She was the smart chick, period. She was the smart person, the smartest person in the class. And so I often say this. It's hard to argue with excellence. You can see whatever differences you want to see. You can see whatever perceived deficits that you want to see. But make sure you also see that I'm a bad boy. That, you know, make sure you also see the fact. Make sure that you also see the fact that we have something to offer, and that something is excellence. If you just simply would open the door and allow that to happen, I promise you, I promise you, your world will elevate. Your world will elevate. And yes, Rosemary does come off extremely, extremely humble, but I, I, I want to brag. I want to brag on her behalf. If she won't brag on her behalf, I will do and so. And the reason that, and, 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 and I will tell you, and I will tell you, I will tell you that so often we approach this thing, and I had to overcome this myself. We approach this thing as if, oh, they're doing us a favor. And the truth is, no, no, you're not doing me a favor. What we're doing is we are exchanging something of value for something of value. And the truth is, the truth is, the value that we both are getting, the value, the value that just in the relationship, let's forget about the money, but the relationship, when it's a right relationship, these become friendships that last a lifetime, that last a lifetime. And so it's important that that we recognize, no, nah, you're not doing me a favor. What happens is so often people like myself, our voices are diminished because we begin to believe that they're doing us a favor instead of demanding what is rightfully should be done. Right. I mean, if you have a job, if you've taken a job, have some work ethic, care about your job, do your job well. I mean, we know that. We know all these things. I promised that I would let you know when Rosemary was making comments. And so I'm going to, um, I, she said when we were bragging about her, um, I'm humble. Thank you so much. And then she said, LaMondre is so incredible. She thinks he should be president. I will line up <laughs> to start voting for him right now, Rosemary. So I say LaMondre for president. I think that could be the best thing that we could do in the United States. I don't know if he wants to be tortured that way, but I'm with you, Rosemary. I would vote for LaMondre in a second. So um, <laughs> let me ask you another question. And, and Rosemary, I apologize if um, the question I ask, if it's not queued up right. So I know that I had asked you, uh, what are some of the nicest things a caregiver ever did for you? Um, and I'm not sure if that one, that one queued up right. So, uh, but the, the next question was also, how can home aid agencies help aides provide better care, which is a really powerful question. So I don't know if your device is going to answer both of those at once. So I, I just wanted to give you the floor again. Oh. Well, Homemade agencies can't provide backups who are well informed about their clients. For example, when a backup is assigned to a client, the agency should email her specific care information. Another thing that agencies must do is let backup or novice age shadow seasoned caregivers let them get hands on experience. Seeing how something is done instead of hearing or reading it makes a difference. Agencies also need to make their employees feel valued. According to payscale.com, the average hourly salary of an aide is $10.81. Many agencies don't offer them paid holidays or health benefits. If clients are to be treated with the best possible care, then caregivers also should be treated with the best possible incentives. Health home made their vital to us persons with disabilities. If it weren't for them, many of us would be in nursing homes. The home aid industry needs to be improved. However, I want to thank you, Deborah, for letting the and me discuss this important topic. You know, one thing that I wanted to do, I, I, I'm aware of some of these situations because of my daughter. I myself have not had the need, but I now am a care, well, I've been a caregiver for a long time. I was a caregiver for my beautiful daughter, and now I'm a caregiver for my husband um, with dementia. And it, it's 
it's challenging and, and understanding it, it, it's, I've been married to this man for over 35 years. And you would think I know him better than anybody else in the world. And I do, but I haven't known him. I don't know how he flosses his teeth, for example. And I went to try to floss his teeth, which I find very hard to floss somebody else's teeth. Um, it, not being new, not being, I mean, I don't know how to do it. And I accidentally hurt his gums. And so he was not pleased with me, which I get, but it, there's so much, there's so many nuances about caregiving. And I love the comments that Rosemary said about the, you know, what, what does the, the company that's hiring people with caregiver, what did they need to do? How do they need to, you know, train and teach caregivers and how do we make sure that the caregivers are feeling valued but also they are doing the right thing by, by the individuals and you know i know that let me toss a question to you uh, lamandre what should people consider when choosing an, can, an attendant care provider and i'll say as you answer the question lamandre what i'm finding using more now that my daughter has a medicaid waiver and we have attendance more than we did in the past there were, I made a lot of assumptions about caregivers that I realize are not true. And it seems like sometimes we don't even have the option. We're, we're just so glad somebody comes, whether they're qualified, whether they have a good attitude, whether they're going to do a good job or not. It, it, it seems like there's a crisis in the caregivers, you know, no, as there, far as getting people there. No, there's, there, there certainly is. And, uh, and, and I think that that would be one of the first things. Don't make any assumptions. Uh, don't assume that because this is the way that you would do it or because as Rosemary said, you would think that someone would, you know, if you're going to put someone on the toilet, you need to remove their trousers in order for that to work, even though you would think um, that that would be common knowledge. My thinking is ask questions, ask questions and don't, you don't necessarily have to accept that that person is the person that cares for you. I, 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 I am just a firm believer. Uh, and that I should have control over who touches my body and who does not. I don't know where that comes from, but I just think that's a basic human right, that you should have the opportunity to choose who touches your body and who does not. Um, one of the things that, that I do before anybody starts working for me or with me is when they come through the door, before we start any task, before we fill out any paperwork, we sit down and we have a conversation. And in that conversation, I lay out my expectations and I ask them, what are their expectations? I tell them what it is that I need from them. And I ask them what it is that they need from me. And if we can come to an agreement and an understanding, then we can move forward with the conversation of hows and whens and scheduling and all that stuff. But outside of that, we have to be compatible as people uh, at first. And I will say also, when choosing an agency, you have to look for agencies that have built-in backups in place. Rosemary talked about uh, some of the issues that she's facing. And honestly, those are the issues that are seen across the board. Um, interestingly enough, on Twitter, I received a, a, a message from someone, I believe they were in Ireland, who talked about the, the fact that they were having problems with um, attendance showing up. Well, that's a problem around the world. But if you're working with an agency, because there are other ways to do this, but if you're working with an agency, you have to work with an agency that has a backup system in place, and you have to lean on them to enforce that. Um, one of the things that I do is I try to get uh, caregivers cross-trained, because so often what happens is they're used to working with the geriatric population, which may have a different set of needs uh, than, than what I do, and I have to kind of train people how to work with me. And just remember this, you are the biggest advocate for you. You are the biggest advocate for you. So if something is being done that's not to your liking, you have to voice it and you should not worry about how people feel about it because ultimately it's about your life and not their feelings. And Lamandre, how do you handle issues when they arise with your um, caregivers. And, and before you answer that question, Rosemary made a couple of comments that I want to just uh, bring out. Um, Rosemary noted that she also has the Medicaid waiver and she does not get to interview the aides. And right. so and, yeah, and here's the thing. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you what's funny about that. I have the Medicaid waiver as well. Uh, and what's really funny about that is that even though the agency sends people to do the care, before they start doing the care, even if it's in the hour that they were supposed to do it, I said, sit down, before we go anywhere, we're going to talk. 
And the reason that is so important to me, and this happens all the time because they don't typically, I've only had a couple of agencies that have sent people out prior to a shift uh, starting so that I could interview them. But whoever walks through my door, we have to have that human connection first. We have to have that. Now, granted, if I don't job with this person, they're still going to get me up that day. They're still going to do that job because I still have to get out of bed. I still have to accomplish whatever task it is that I have to accomplish. But the end of it is going to be, okay, now we have to do something different. And and that's what has to happen. So I I, I get that. I get that fully. And, and so you really have to begin to, you have to begin to bend this system towards you. You have to make it work for you. And they'll tell you, oh, we don't do that. We can't do that. Oh, well, yeah, you are. Because you have to remember, they're not doing you a favor either. Right. They're, working they're getting paid. You. And the agencies right. are getting paid nicely yes. to provide this yes. care for you. So uh, we, we have to than, demand. Better than the individuals. Yeah. Absolutely. We have to demand customer service because ultimately we are the customer. And we have to take to the airwaves and we have to talk about this Absolutely. and we have to write letters and we have to think, um, we, we have to thank people, you know, when they're doing something right, as we, you know, gave a major shout out to New York City and to Uber in New York City. So, you know, we've got to reward the people that are doing it right, but we've got to really, really call people out in a nice way. Um, and Rosemary said that uh, that's where she gets in trouble with agencies is she yeah. does talk to them about, you know, why they're not meeting their needs because they work for her. Right. And so the agencies are going to do what they did to Rosemary. Oh, well, let's, we're going to give you a 30 day notice. You're too much trouble, Rosemary. Right. You expect right. us to remove your underpants when it's time to go to the bathroom. How dare you be so demanding, right. Rosemary? Right. So, and, and, and let me but, tell you, I've had that problem too. I've had that problem too. I've had I've had many agencies say that they they didn't want to work with me, that they couldn't work with me because I demanded more from them. But here's the thing. Oh, that's so here's sad. the thing. There's an agency out there that will. The thing is, you really have to present what your expectations are up front, and you have to let them know from the beginning that this is what this is what I require. This is what the needs are. Um, and and you also, have to do the reviews too, right? I think absolutely. you should review them, review them on the social media, award them, reward them when they're doing the right thing, but call them out and say, hey, what you doing over here? It, only because that is how we do it in society. Right. So, you know, we rate our restaurants, we rate the hotels, we rate the Ubers and the Lyft drivers, we tip people when they do the right thing, even though they think they're supposed to get tipped, whether they do show up two, and a, two hours, 45 minutes late. Right. No, tipping is for service. Right, so. right, right. No, and, and Rosemary, I, I, I will also tell you, in, and I know you've, you've, you've experienced this as well, so often, again, I keep going back to this, we're doing you a favor thing. But but the truth is, the truth is, I am your customer. You are providing a service. And the difference with agencies is that there is other competition out there. You know, and, and the other thing that I would also recommend that people do, find people who are in similar situations and find out what they do. Find out what agencies they've used. Because a lot of times, they've already bumped their heads uh, in these situations. So they can tell you, hey, watch out for this. You really might want to consider that. So it really is about making certain that we actually talk to the community and specifically people with disabilities, because again, sometimes the need is different than when you're dealing with uh, folks who primarily specialize in, as they say, the geriatric population. I agree. And I think it, we talk to each other. I know that when my daughter was moving out, I have multiple parents that have children, adult children, Sarah's age, they were like, okay, well, then how did they do this? And, how, and we all talk, we're all talking to each other. Right. Um, so, you know, we, and now we're on social media and we have really powerful programs like Lamondre's program and Rosemary. And so, and, and so let me just go ahead and, you know, ask both of you, because I know this interview went a little bit longer than uh, the other interviews, but I sure am hoping that, Everybody's listening to what's being said here because this is critical information. If you are a caregiver, you need to be listening to this. If you're an agency and you want to have us as customers, you need to be listening to this. If you're an employer, you need to accommodate us and you need to let us work from home and work in your business. But if you want innovative talent 
and we talk about this all the time on the show. You want the Lamondre and Rosemary. I don't want you to steal them from me. I used to say, well, I know I'll be a success when these big companies come and start stealing my employees. I don't want you to steal these two. <laughs> They're too wonderful. But also not my job to stand in their way. So, um, but Rosemary, I'm wondering if you have any final words for the audience. Um, and if there's, you know, anything that you wish the audience knew, but let me turn the floor over to you for final words. I don't have to like to wish both of you and everybody listening happy holidays. You can reach me on Facebook. It's Rosemary Musaccio. On LinkedIn, it's Rosemary Musaccio. The PACC on Twitter, it's at Rose Musaccio. All one word. And you can also find her on our website, www.rueglobal.com. So we're always tagging Rosemary. And you can see her. She did um, a couple of episodes of her show. You can see it out there. And like I said, she's been on Human Potential at Work before. And she will be on LaMondre's show. They're doing a lot of stuff together. So um, LaMondre, um, tell the audience how, you know, any final words that you have and also how they can find you on social media too. Absolutely. Um, well, before I even go go into that, Rosemary also is a brilliant writer in terms of her blogs. So if you oh, if you would look her up and look at her blogs, you you would see uh, just some amazingly well written content that's really life changing. So I, I'm again, I will brag, uh, even if she won't, I will brag. Um, but in in terms of final words re regarding this topic, this topic is really about people living their everyday lives. As I said, in this relationship and in, in the attendant uh, uh, care relationship, you know, someone is coming in and doing the most intimate of intimate things uh, for you. And when the situation is right, they move from um, a service provider to really a friend and then even beyond that to family. And that's what the relationship really becomes. Um, and we have to keep in mind that it is a very unique um, relationship people are not doing you a favor. This is a service. Um, this is something that enables your life. This is something um, that's necessary for you to live your life. So, and I also believe that people with disabilities have to be the voice. People with disabilities have to stand up and say what it is that they need as an individual and to the system as well. So we have to be a part of that advocacy. We have to know what's going on legislatively, and we have to realize where those dollars are being prioritized. So we have to be that voice. And I think that if, if there was a last word, it, was, it, it is to be the voice to change the life so that you can live the life that you want to live, bottom line. Um, and if you want to get in contact with me, uh, you can get with me at Twitter with Lamandre underscore P. That's Lamandre underscore P. Same thing on Instagram, Lamondre underscore P. If you're on Facebook, Lamondre Pew, and you'll see my big bald head uh, up there on Facebook. And you can also uh, listen to my podcast, and that's 5P with Lamondre. That's 5P with Lamondre. You can follow that page on 5P Podcast on both Twitter and Facebook. And thank you so much, Deborah, for allowing Rosemary and myself to share this great forum with you. And of course, you can. Check us all out on the Rue Global website, www.rueglobal.com, R-U-H, global.com. Thank you. Lamondre, are you on LinkedIn also? I am. Why did I forget about LinkedIn? Yes, yeah, I am. On, I thought you were on LinkedIn too, yeah. I am. Lamondre <laughs> Pew on LinkedIn. We believe in being on social media. We so. are there for sure. <laughs> and, and I'm glad that you brought up the blog because Rosemary's written so many powerful blogs and she recently wrote one on caregivers, which we will put the, um, we'll put that out there um, on, on the description page so that everybody can watch that. But I'm very grateful for you and Rosemary. You are the reason why I do this work. And I, I just am amazed by both of you and the talent that you bring. And I believe that if you look at the people with disabilities all over the world, you know, it's, you're going to see people like LaMondre and Rosemary that can add so much if we would just let them do it. So that's what we're about at Root Global Impact. And that's why I create human potential at work because people are valuable. And why don't we just get out of the way and let people show you what they can do if you give them the chance. So thanks everybody for listening to the program today. I'm so 
absolutely thrilled to have Lamondre and Rosemary on the show today. Special thanks to um, Doug Foresta, our producer behind the scenes. And Rosemary sent me, I told you, you know, got us in what she's saying. She said, we love you, Deborah. You're my hero. So uh, you right back at your Rosemary. And you know what? We are just helping each other show who we are and make sure that others are included. What could be more important than that? So um, we're making a difference at Real Global Impact and we're very proud of it. And I'm very proud of these two executives at Real Global Impact. 